Hey everyone, welcome to the first video of this web API design series. As a backend engineer, it's crucial to have excellent knowledge in web API design. There's a lot of fine details that go into the design of a successful web API. Once you've designed, built, and released your API, be it internal or external, it is extremely tedious to make significant changes to it over time. This is why, as a backend engineer, you have to really understand the fine details of a successful web API. In this series, I will try to cover several topics that can help you become a solid backend API engineer. In this first video, let's talk about the different request response API paradigms. Fundamentally, APIs can be broken down into either request response APIs or event driven APIs. The focus of this video is purely on request response APIs. I'll make another video where I'll cover event driven APIs. Um, so when it comes to request response style APIs, there are three commonly used standards here. They are representational state transfer, which is more commonly referred to as REST APIs. And then you have remote procedure call or RPC style APIs. And finally, you have GraphQL APIs. All three paradigms have their strengths and weaknesses. There is no good or bad, it really depends on your use case. For the scope of this video, I'm not going to go into detail about these paradigms. I'm going to cover them briefly and hopefully at the end of this video, you will know which standard to use for your needs. Okay, so let's talk about REST APIs very briefly. So REST APIs are all about resources. Typically, you would name your resources using nouns. Using verbs like get user is incorrect in REST APIs. Each resource would typically have two URLs, one for the collection, like users in this case, and another for an entity in that collection by specifying the identifier of that entity. So consumers would be allowed to use these resources using crude-like operations. So your typical create, read, update, and delete operations, these are perfect for REST APIs. Now, the way you do this is you would typically match your crude operations to these HTTP verbs. So a post or a put call would allow you to create a new user, a get call would allow you to retrieve a user, a patch or a put might allow you to update one, and a delete would just delete the resource. REST APIs typically return JSON or XML data, but JavaScript has become really famous over the last decade or so, and now it's very common to use JSON as the response type of REST APIs. So I just talked about collections and entities. This is what I meant. Making a call to this users endpoint is going to return the entire collection of users. So if you had a thousand users in there, you would be returning all of them. Um, there are advanced topics like pagination that you can use to limit the number of users that you're returning, but I'm not going to cover those in this video. But for the purposes of this video, you would have a resource calling that resource directly, in this case like users, would return the entire collection. If you wanted to access an entity inside that resource, you would specify the identifier of that particular entity, in this case, let's say user1. So making a get call here would return only that specific entity and REST is also good for showing relationships among resources. So just by looking at this URL, we can say that users have a collection called orders and a particular user has a bunch of orders that they can have. So it's very explicit here and you can do that and represent those relationships using URLs. You could also get into a particular entity, which in this case is an entity of sub-resource. So your main resource is users, and then you have your sub-resource, which is orders, and you can get into an entity inside that by again specifying the identifier of that entity. 
Now, what about non-crude operations? So we know that REST is great for crude operations, but sometimes you need to perform non-crude operations. And this is when things get a little tricky in REST APIs. Say you want to archive a certain user. This sort of action that you want to perform on a resource doesn't really fit into crude style operations. A typical solution in REST is to send some data in the body to perform this action. So you would send in the body with maybe a flag of a field. So in this case, archived is true, and you would send it to that particular entity's endpoint. Let's look at another example. In this case, you might want to deactivate a particular user. And this again is very much an action. So a different way to solve this problem is to actually use the sub resource as the actions name. So in RESTful APIs, you don't want to use nouns as your resource, but it is completely acceptable to use them at a sub resource level, or rather it is a way around to solve some of these non crude operational problems. An even more trickier thing is something like search. This just does not fit in well with REST APIs and typically you would solve this problem uh, by using query parameters and you would particularly open up a special endpoint to accept this kind of query parameters. So we've talked a bit about REST. Let's look at some of the benefits of using REST. As you saw, standardizing your method names and arguments are built into the paradigm itself. It uses HTTP features really well by using the HTTP verbs to describe the precise operation that you're trying to perform. REST APIs are also the easiest to maintain compared to the rest of the bunch. Some drawbacks? Well, big payloads is very common with REST APIs. For example, I might be getting the entire user entity but I only probably want to use maybe the name or maybe another particular field. Unfortunately, you're going to be getting the entire resource back. And this is quite unnecessary, so it leads to big payloads. Another example of a drawback is multiple HTTP round trips. So if you want to get a resource and its sub resource, well, you have to make two separate calls first to get the resource and second to get the sub resource. There's no way of combining the results together, not in a restful manner anyway. In general, REST is great when you want to expose resources and limit the type of operations to crude-like operations. So think of APIs that are purely meant to store and retrieve data. This type of API benefits the most by sticking to REST paradigm. All right, so we've talked about REST APIs. Let's move on to RPC style APIs. If REST is all about resources, well, RPC is all about actions. RPC style APIs have become quite common among API providers these days, and Slack is one of them. This paradigm usually has endpoints for each action and Slack has many of them. In this case, we're looking at a few examples from that chat API. HTTP-based RPC APIs usually support GET for read-only requests and POST for the rest. Let's talk about some of the benefits of RPC APIs. So to begin with, they are easy to understand. As the action is usually a part of the URL itself, they are pretty self-descriptive. Another benefit is how lightweight the payloads can be. Because they are tied to actions directly, payloads tend to be associated with the action itself and therefore tends to be lightweight. RPC APIs usually have high performance because they are so action-oriented. Let's look at some of the drawbacks. Now, first of all, RPC APIs can be difficult to discover. 
It is not possible to assume operations available on resources because they are not standardized like REST APIs. This is also the second drawback of RPC APIs. The limited standardization can become tedious to work with, referencing documentation becomes super important. Not that it's not important for REST APIs, but then again for RPC style APIs, it's that much more important. Another negative is that this style can lead to function explosion over time. As features are added to your products, the number of endpoints representing these functions can grow out of control. This leads to function explosion. Overall, RPC style APIs serve a key purpose that REST APIs just can't seem to do well in. That is, they are good for APIs exposing actions rather than crude-like operations. Finally, let's talk about GraphQL APIs. GraphQL is a query language for APIs that was internally developed by Facebook but is now starting to get wide adoption by top API providers, notably GitHub, Yelp, and Pinterest. They expose a single endpoint as an entry point. The client defines the structure of the data that is required and the server returns exactly that structure. Typically, only POST and GET are supported in GraphQL APIs. So an example of a request is something like this. This specifies the required structure to be a collection of users which contain the name and the username fields. And the server returns exactly that, a collection of users which contain the name and the username fields only. So let's talk about some of the benefits of using GraphQL APIs. Now one of the most obvious ones is that the client can define the exact data that is required. And this is going to save the number of trips the client is going to need to make to get that requested data. A client could request multiple nested levels of data from a resource in a single call. For example, getting the orders and the users can be done in a single call in this case, as long as you structure the data the way you require it to be. Another benefit is that it avoids versioning altogether. Now, versioning is something I did not touch for REST and RPC style APIs. But in short, as you make changes to your APIs, you might introduce breaking changes. And as you do this, you would introduce new versions of your API. Now, in GraphQL APIs, you don't necessarily have to do that. You can add new fields without breaking the existing queries. Similarly, you can deprecate existing fields by doing a log analysis of the usage of those fields. Because you know exactly how the consumers are requesting those fields, you can find out and deprecate them. REST and RPC usually return data that the client might not use. With GraphQL, the client defines exactly what is needed resulting in payload sizes being smaller. Now, there's always a price to be paid for these benefits. Added complexity is one of them. The server needs to handle the complexity of the type of query the client constructs. This can get quite complicated depending on the nature of your data. Optimizing performance in the backend for your queries can also become difficult. When working with external users, it becomes difficult to identify their use cases, as they can vary quite a bit. This makes performance optimization in the backend quite a difficult challenge. GraphQL APIs, put it simply, are just not good or not ideal for simple APIs. They're far too complicated and they should not be used for simple things. For those things, you should probably stick with REST APIs or maybe RPC. In the end, you should consider using GraphQL only when you need the kind of querying flexibility that it offers. Now, GitHub is a good example of this. Their REST payloads were starting to get out of control as they added new features and data over time. 
they realized that they were returning a ton of data that their consumers just didn't need. Eventually, they started embracing GraphQL style APIs to solve that exact problem. So unless you're solving problems of that nature, GraphQL might not be for you. It might make more sense for you to stick to REST or RPC style APIs. Alright guys, that's it for this video. In the next video of this series, I'll be talking about event-driven APIs. Thanks a lot for watching this. Please like this video if you found it helpful and subscribe for more videos in the future.